Okay, so today I will give you an overview about algebraic geometry code for, from surfaces and I hope that it will give you some uh, insight to look at these kind of things and to be convinced that, that we can look at something else than curves. And so my presentation will be something like that. I will, just talk, I will first talk about algebraic geometry codes in case you don't know what it is at all. And I know there is at least one person here so it's nice that I've done this. Then I will talk about the AG codes from surfaces. I will also discuss about their effectiveness, how they're really useful in real life. And then I will finish my presentation uh, talking about their local properties. Okay, so first, algebraic geometry codes. What do I need to define an algebraic geometry code? I need algebraic geometry. And so first, I need X, a smooth projective variety defined over a finite field FQ. And the divisor uh, on this variety is a former, former finite sum of irreducible sub-varieties of co-dimension one. So on a curve, it's a sum of points. On surfaces, it's a sum of curves, and so on. And the set of divisor will be denoted by div of X. I define also what is um, an effective divisor. So a divisor is a sum of, uh, of um, sub-varieties. And if all the coefficients in, in front of these varieties are non-negative, I will say that this divisor is effective. And I will denote it like that with this ah, with g uh, larger than or equal to 0. The support of the divisor is basically the union of the variety forming this divisor. And finally, I need a crucial object, which is the Riemann Hall space of this divisor, if the divisor is defined over FQ, this is an FQ vector space defined like that. So it's a set of non-zero function whose principal divisor plus G is effective, and I have to add the zero function to make it a vector space. And so the principal divisor of a function is something like that. So for each variety, I need a coefficient, and the coefficient is the order of F along this variety. OK. Uh, so during my talk, I will probably talk about section or global section instead of function. And just to precise you, this is the kind of object I'm talking about. So the elements of L of G, I will call them section at some point. I need another uh, last uh, definition before defining algebraic geometry code. It's the linear equivalence and the Picard group. So two divisors are said to be linearly equivalent if their difference is a principal divisor of some function. And the Picard group will be the set of the divisor modulo this equivalence. Okay, so we have plenty of definitions, and from them, I can define an algebraic geometry code for any dimensional variety. No, it's not a curve or a surface. For any dimension, you can define an AG code. And in case you just saw light and you entered this room, what is a code? <laughs> so, uh, and it's just to set some notations. So if I take a linear code over FQ of length n, it's just a vector subspace of FQ to the n. I do not by k its dimension. We have a weight of the vector, which are just the number of coordinates of non-zero coordinates. And finally, one crucial parameter is the minimum distance, which is the minimum weight of a non-zero code word. And I use heavily that my code li is linear to define it like this. So finally, what is an AG code? So I use sussman vladut's construction. And so to define an AG code, I need a set of points, let's say n, with this n being the same, a set of rational points of the variety, a divisor, whose support does not meet P. And then I consider an evaluation map which takes elements in L of G and form a vector of length n in which each coordinate is the evaluation of F at each of these points. And the fact this um, hypothesis ensures that this is well defined. I have no zero no poles in, uh, in the point P, among the point in P. And so an AG code is just the image of L of G uh, under this evaluation map. First remark, if I, get two, if I, if I choose two uh, linearly equivalent divisor, I get two uh, Hamming equivalent codes. So basically the same code. If you move your divisor, you get basically the same code with the same parameters. And so I'll talk about parameters. What are the, what are the parameters of the code? So the length is the number of evaluation points for so the cardinality of P. 
The dimension is at most the dimension of L of G, so it's noted by small l of G. And what about the minimum distance? So we can remark that for any section of L of G, if I look at the weight of the, its evaluation, it's n minus the number of zero coordinates, which, which is the intersection between p and the zero locus of the function. And so the minimum distance will be n minus the maximum of this quantity for any non-zero f like this. And so remember this, uh, this uh, red square, because here it comes again. If I, want, if I know that this maximum is less than a certain b, which is less than, uh, than n, then I know that the evaluation map is injective, and so the dimension is indeed L of g, and I have a lower bound on the minimum distance. And so the crucial thing to have the minimum distance is to upper bound this guy, right? OK, so what about when c is a curve, right? Because you are used uh, of curves, so let's go. So if I assume that I have a smooth projective curve of genus G, then the divisor, as I said before, is just a form of sum of points, right? And I can also define the degree of the divisor, which is uh, the sum of the ni's times the degree of the pi uh, uh, over fq. So for the length, I need the number of rational points on the curve, and I know that uh, thanks to the Asseville theorem cited by uh, Maya Montanucci yesterday, for instance, that the, um, the number of rational points on the curves is bounded from above by q plus 1 plus 2g square root of q. And this gives us uh, an upper bound on the length, right? For the dimension, we can use the riemann hoch theorem on curve, which states that if I take L of G minus L of Kx minus G, where Kx is the canonical divisor on X, this is equal to the degree of G minus, yeah, minus G plus one. And this term may be hard to, to handle, but we know that this is zero, for instance, if G uh, is a degree more than two G plus two. Okay, and finally, about the minimum distance, so I have a curve and I want to compute the maximum number of points intersected with P. And what is nice on the curve is that the zero locus of F draws some points on the curve. And since, um, since F is in L of G, we know that the number of points uh, at which F vanishes is less than or equal to the degree of G. So we know plenty of things about AG codes on curve. But if you want to work on the surfaces, then you have a variety with more points. So you should have codes which are longer. But we have a problem regarding the minimum distance because now the zero locus is a curve. So it can be a nice curve, a less nice curve, <laughs> and also highly reducible. And so computing the number of points P in the zero locus is really really harder than just counting points um, in the zero locus of f when you work on a curve. Okay, so what is an example of AG codes from a surface? I think that maybe all of you know that uh, all know Riedmüller codes. So this is the very, very first example of AG code from higher dimensional variety, as reed solomon codes are the very first example of AG code on the curve. So what do I need to define the Riedmüller codes? I need an integer n which is larger than or equal to 1, a non-negative uh, degree r, and so the Riedmüller codes of order r will be the evaluation of polynomials, of n variant polynomials in, of degree at most r, at all the, the n tuples of fq. Okay, and if r is less than q, the parameters are really easy to compute. We are sure that this, evalu the, this evaluation is injective, and so the code has dimension precisely the dimension of this guy here. And the minimum distance is reached by product of linear factors, so it's it corresponds to highly reducible sections in, uh, in the riemann hoch space, and so it's easy to um, see that the minimum distance is this. Okay, and so why do I say that this is an AG code? You just take 
our favorite variety, I think, so the projective plane of, um, of dimension n. You take this set of evaluation points, so the affine point of the projective space. I am used to put x0 is equal to 1 as a, a fine point, but uh, it depends on, uh, on your convictions. And, um, and so this set is isomorphic to fq to the n, right? So it looks like we have the right amount of points. So what is the Riemann-Hall space associated to this code? You take the hyperplane defined by x0 is equal to 0. So it's, it has co-dimension 1 in Pn, so it defines a divisor. And for the divisor, I will take r times h. And it's not so difficult to see that the Riemann-Hall space associated to this guy is the set of homogeneous polynomials in n plus 1 variables of degree exactly r divided by x0 to the r. And so um, this is clear that when you evaluate these guys at this point, you get exactly the codes here. I hope this is clear because I see some, uh, some uh, frownings. <laughs> so, um, and so yeah, so I have equality here since I have chosen my hyperplane like this and my points like this. OK. So, just to remember that the Riemann-Hall space here, it captures the functions which vanishes with order r on h. So it's basically uh, things of uh, quotients is equ equals to x0 to the r. OK. So this is the very first example of AG codes from higher dimensional varieties. And it starts a large bibliography about AG codes from higher high dimensional uh, varieties and then surfaces. And so clearly this is not exhaustive. So if you don't find your name here, please be kind with me. So, um, so Rindmuller codes have been introduced in 54. And then Lachaud uh, generalized them by in, um, evaluating on the whole uh, set of uh, the projective space in uh, 86. And these parameters are being heavily studied. Then arrived that we call the, what I call the restriction of the Rindmuller codes to uh, projective algebraic geometry by uh, one of the organizers, Aubry. Um, and then he worked on quadric surfaces uh, one year later. Um, so Hansen in 2001 raised the question like, why should we stuck on curve? It's interesting to, to have a look on varieties of higher dimension. And so he proposed a general study of this code. And in the same year, people had a look on the case where P is a complete intersection. They don't really care about the variety, but the fact that P is highly structured is a complete intersection. And it is even more when it's in linearly uh, general position. And in 2002, Anson proposed uh, codes on toric varieties. And then people started to focus on surfaces, OK? It's, we have this example of codes from surfaces, but it's, only the, uh, it's almost the only example before this, um, this date. And so in 2005, Edeku proposed some codes on the Hermitian surface. And then Zarzar in 2007 uh, suggested that we should explore surfaces with small p current. And Little and Sheng uh, on, kept on this idea by looking at uh, surfaces with p current 1 or sectional genus is equal to zero. So the, the genus of curve in the Riemann-Hall space should be zero if they are irreducible. And finally, more recently, we have uh, excellent codes on del Pozzo surfaces with Picard rank one. So Bla by Blash, Couvreur, Alain, Mador, uh, myself, Rambo, and uh, Andriam. And some codes on the Abelian surfaces by Aubry, Berardini, Herbeau, and Perret. OK, so we have like an overview of what has been done on, uh, on surfaces. And I will uh, first now focus on what do I mean by this restriction of Friedmuller codes to our algebraic geometry. So first, I need to define restriction of the code. So I'm not sure this is a really well-defined thing in the literature, but I will heavily use this term, so let's go. I need to define it. So if I have a linear code and some, um, some uh, subset of indices in uh, 1n, the restriction of the code is basically the projection of the code on the coordinate in i. So in the literature, it's called the puncturing outside i, but I find it more natural to say we restrict to i. 
and it's kind of natural because in the case of um, of AG codes, in evaluation codes, if I start from a code at in which I evaluate points in P and I take a subset of P, I think it's natural to say that this is a restriction to P prime instead of P, right? So this code is a restriction of this one. And if you take a sub variety Y of X, you can restrict this code to Y. So you just focus on the points in Y and you in fact de um, define an AG code on Y and we can define, so this writing is not rigorous but I hope you excuse me. So I see this guy as a divisor on Y. I intersect the divisor with the variety Y and then I see this as a divisor on Y. Okay, so from this, I am able to define the restriction of a Riedmüller code because as soon as I have a variety um, embedded in some PN, even if it's a curve on a plane, for instance, I can uh, take an hyperplane once again, my favorite one, let's say x0 is equal to 0, and I can consider the points which are the affine point on the variety, right? The affine rational points on the variety. And then I can restrict uh, uh, the Riedmüller codes to the point in P, and I get, uh, I'm just evaluating polynomials at the point in P, so it's really nice. And this is an AG code on the variety, which is associated to a multiple of the hyperplane section of the variety. And so this code uh, is really easy to define because as soon as you are able to compute the rational points of the variety using magma, so you should take n not too large, right? <laughs> and q not too large also. Uh, you're just evaluating some n variate polynomials at the points on the variety. And so how do we get the parameters of this guy? You can use the geometry of y, but you can also use the property of p as a zero dimensional algebraic set. And this is the reason why people focused on the case where p is a complete intersection, for instance. And so from this exact sequence, which defines p as a subscheme of, uh, of pn, you can have this uh, cohomology sequence. And so this uh, set is basically this one. Okay, and so the kernel of your evaluation map is here. And the only thing that really bothers you is this term. And this term is quite hard to handle because it measures how the points in P fail to give independent relations in degree R. So it, it is really connected to the geometry of P, right? But these codes, as I told you, are nice because you have an explicit generating family polynomials, and I insist it is not a basis, right, because this guy may be not zero. As soon as you have a polynomial of degree r in the equations of your points or your variety, you do not have a basis anymore. And the problem in this is that you have to embed x, uh, x in some pn, and you clearly cannot explore all the AG codes with this. Like here you are just exploring the codes associated to the hyperplane section of the, um, of the variety. And so if you want to look at another divisor, another family of uh, um, unidimensional family of, uh, of divisor, you have to change your embedding. So it's clearly dependent from the embedding. OK, so this concludes uh, the part about uh, some example of codes from higher dimensional varieties. And now I want to focus on um, the parameters from edge, for edge codes from surfaces. So we will need uh, something which looks like the Riemann-Hoch theorem, right? And something to handle the minimum distance. So what about the Riemann-Hoch theorem? To do this, to write it, we will need an important tool on surfaces. And it has been used, for instance, yesterday by Eula Schneider, which is uh, the intersection product on surface, right? So if you've never seen any of this, we go, we go see <laughs> it together. So this is a pairing. So it's a thing that takes two divisor and returns you an integer. And so it's denoted like this with a dot. And if these divisors are basically non-singular curves meeting transversely, then the intersection product is like the name may, uh, may uh, let us think, the number of intersection points. So I, here it is really geometric points. It's not only the rational points, right? This pairing is symmetric. It's also additive. 
and something which is really important, it only depends on the linear equivalence class of the divisor. So if you have two divisors which are linearly equivalent, their intersection with any other guy will be the same. And if I compute the intersection of C with itself, I will call it the square of C sometimes, but also the self-intersection, and it's denoted like this. So let's have an example on the simplest surface once again, what happens on P2. So if I take two lines here, these guys are linearly equivalent. Why? Because if I take the quotient of the equation of these two lines, I get a function on P2, and this exactly gives me the principal divisor that I want, okay? And their self-intersection, what is it? Since I have this uh, dependency only on linear, equ linear equivalence classes, their square is also their intersection each other, and so it is one. And this is what is really useful. If I want to compute the self-intersection, one way to do this is to move this curve when it is possible, and then to compute the intersection with this um, moved um, guys. If I take now a conic, so the intersection with a line is uh, two, and even if the line does not meet the conic, the intersection is two, and this conic is equivalent to two times the line. And once again, if I take another conic, of course, it is equivalent to my conic, and the self-intersection is equal to four, because if I take generally two conics, they meet in four, uh, at four points. If I take a curve of degree d, it is linearly equivalent to d times the line, and basically two curves are linearly equivalent if and only if they have the same degree, and this is really special uh, of the projective plane. You should not think about it for any surface. And so, in fact, the intersection theory is captured by Bezos' theorem, because if I take two curves of degree d and d prime, the intersection product is d times d prime. Okay. So why do I need this? It's because it arises in the Riemann-Hoch theorem on surfaces. So I do not buy k of x, a canonical divisor of x, and if I take a divisor g, I have this nice equality. So this term is the Euler characteristic of the sheaf associated to g, and so L of g minus the h1 of this sheaf, which is denoted by S of g, and it is called the superabundance, plus the h2, which is by Searle's duality, the, the L of kx minus g, this quantity is equal to half the product of g by g minus k plus 1 plus the arithmetic genus of the surface, which is defined as 1 plus the other characteristic of its structural shift. Okay, so we have plenty of terms, and the one that uh, fascinates us for the dimension is uh, the blue one, right? And so uh, I need to handle this guy and this guy, this guy will be really hard, but I can handle this one. You remember on the curve, we know that if the, the divisor has degree more than 2g plus 2, uh, minus 2, sorry, we remove this guy. But we have the same thing on the curve, on the surface, sorry. For this, I need an ample divisor. If I take, so, an ample divisor, what is this? By a nakai moshezen criterion, it is a guy whose self-intersection is positive and meets all the irreducible curve positively also. And the proposition states that if I have an ample divisor which meets kx less than g, basically, then this green term is zero. And so we are kind of happy because even if I can handle this guy, and it's even worse when you are bad at cohomology like me, um, we have a lower bound on the dimension of the Riemann-Hoch space. It is this term. Okay, so I know some things about the, the dimension. Okay, what about the minimum distance? So naively, how do I bound a minimum distance? So as usual, we want a lower bound on the minimum distance. Now we'll assume that I will evaluate at every rational point on my surface. And so if I take a function in uh, L of g, I can write its zero locus like this as a divisor. And so we have this decomposition. And so what happens? If I want to lower bound the minimum distance, I need to upper bound the number of points in here. So it is n minus the maximum of the uh, rational points of all the um, wh yi which appear in the decomposition of this guy. And so to bound the minimum distance from below, I need an upper bound on 
the number of irreducible components, which may be really hard, and the number of FQ rational points on the curve YI. And if you are curious about what happens when your surface is embedded in P3, everything's fine, okay? Um, you can have a look on uh, Elena Berardini's talk this afternoon about uh, joint work together, okay? And if you want to uh, brutally apply a surveil bound on the curve here, you can use the adjunction formula, which says that if I have a curve of, of arithmetic genius pi on the surface, then I have a formula for its genius. 2 times pi minus 2 is equal to the intersection of C with C plus the canonical divisor. So we know plenty of things of the geometry of the curves on the surface, but as you may um, you may think it's hard to bound the number of reducible components and it's, and it's also hard to bound the, um, this guy, so we need something else. And it's not really a closed formula, so it's not really satisfactory. And this is the reason why Hansen had a look on the Sechadri constant. So what is this thing? So now I need to assume that my divisor G from which I define my AG code is now ample. You remember, so self-intersection positive and meets every curve positively also. And from this, from this I can define the Sechadri constant of the divisor at the point P. So this is one definition. Um, this is the infimum of among all the curves in X which indeed meet P of the intersection of C with G divided by the sum of the multiplicity of the curve C at the point P. Of, of each point pi. And so it's an infimum, so it may be also hard to compute, but it gives you a lower bound, which is nice to remember. If I know that this quantity is at least some integer, let's say epsilon, and I think it's a weird choice to name epsilon an integer, but <laughs> never mind. Um, the minimum distance of the code is at least n minus the square of g divided by epsilon. And if you know even more, if you know that there exists some integer zeta, so that the tensor power of L of G uh, of power zeta times the vanishing ideal of P is generated by global section, then you have a little better. You know that uh, N is D is uh, larger than N minus zeta times uh, G squared. But the problem, as you may understand here, this is really hard to compute, right? This is an infimum and we have to run uh, on all the curves. It's impractical. And so in the same paper, Anson proposed another idea, which is more natural, let's say. So I assume that I have R curves, which covers my point. So this is what he called covering curves. So the evaluation point are all contained in some of the CIs, some of the rational points of the CIs. And I assume that I am able to control how many points in P I have on each CI, bounded by uh, N which does not depend on I. And I also assume that G meets CI uh, non-negatively. And if I am able to control this guy, which is L, it's the maximum of CIs contained in the zero locus of uh, a function in L of G then I have a, mm, a bound on the minimum distance. I know that this is at least n minus l times big N minus the sum of this intersection product. So this may be hard to compute. We have first a refinement. If I know that this intersection are bounded by some eta which is less than n, I have a refinement on the bounds. I do not ask you to remember all these bounds that they will be uh, in the next slide. And then if I want to control L, I have something else. If I know that I have a NEF divisor and NEF is less than ample because you just ask for uh, meeting every curve non-negatively. But if its NEF divisor meets each CI positively, then you have a bound on L. We know that this is less than the intersection product of G and H divided by the minimum of, of this guy. So this is, uh, I know, a plenty of formula to remember. This is the reason why I will spend some time on an example on P1 cross P1. So I have remembered you all that we need here. So let's go on P1 cross P1. So this is a nice variety because it has a very nice 
picker rank, right? Its picker rank is generated by two guys, the horizontal line and the vertical line, okay? Their self-intersection is zero because I can move a vertical line uh, and they don't meet. The same thing for the, horizon the horizontal line. I think I reversed horizontal and vertical, but I think you're okay with this. And the intersection horizontal and vertical is one because they meet at one point. So now I take a divisor, which is d1 times h plus d2 time, uh, times v. And so I run basically all the hg codes on p1 cross p1, because as I told you, it is up to equivalence in the p rank. So if I am able to control the parameters of the an hg codes defined by this divisor, I have run all the divisors. I know everything about codes on p1 cross p1. And something which is really nice is that I know a basis of the Riemann-Roch space of this guy. When you evaluate a section in this, you are basically evaluating bihomogeneous polynomials, so in two sets of variables, where your degree in x is less than, it's exactly equal to d1, and the degree in y is exactly equal to d2. So a really explicit family in the, um, in the Riemann-Roch space. And if I choose p, as uh, the whole set of rational points, I can cover all my points by, let's say, Q vertical lines. And so all these lines are equivalent to V. So these are my P covering curves. Now I am happy I have P which is included in, the, in this union. I need also to control this, and since these curves have Q plus one points, N is equal to Q plus one. Okay, so what about uh, this? I need to compute this intersection. Uh, I didn't do it, but it's okay. <laughs> I need to find a nav divisor, right? So the nav divisor has a really well chosen name because it's once again H. And so if I compute the intersection of H with CIs, it's the same as as h with v, because they are linearly equivalent, and so this is one. And using this bound, I know that l is at most uh, g dot h divided by one, and g dot h is equal to d2, thanks to these relations. And so if I gather all of this, so the number of rational points is q plus one squared, right? The dimension, if I compute the dimension of this space, I get d1 plus 1 times d2 plus 1. And so I apply brutally the formula. So I have n minus l, which I bound by d2 times n, minus r, which is q plus 1, because I take q plus 1 lines, minus d2, which is once again l, which is here, times d1. And so I have this formula, which is symmetric with respect to d1 and, uh, and d2 which is good news. And something which is even better news is that it is attained. So this is the actual minimum distance of the code. And it's really easy to find a polynomial achieving this bound. So everything is fine. This method seems to work. But as you may remark, we need plenty of information on the curve, right? We need, and this L may be really hard to handle. So this is the reason why some people have introduced p-interpolating linear system. So what is a linear system? It's a family of linearly equivalent effective divisors. And the base locus of a linear system is the intersection of all their supports. So this is the set, this is a, the varieties contained in all the divisors in the linear system. And I need a last definition before uh, defining p interpolating linear system. It's this notation. So if I take a linear system and y a sub variety, I will denote by gamma minus y the maximal linear subsystem of y whose element of element whose lo base locus contains y. So this is all the guys in gamma which contains y in their best base locus. So all the divisor in which you can see y in the components in gamma. Okay, so in 2020, Couvreur, Perry and Lebac defined p-interpolating system uh, 
So this is a linear system for some points p, so that gamma minus p is non-empty. So it means that we have some divisors in gamma which passes through p, and the base locus of gamma minus p has dimension zero. We do not want that all the guys in gamma minus p meet in one curve. We just want them to meet at some points. So we have a family of curves covering our points, but we don't want them to have um, common components, because otherwise our bound will be uh, uh, irrelevant. OK, and from them, they proved a really easy bound, which looks a lot like the bound we have on curves, because the minimum distance is now lower bounded by n minus the product of gamma with g. And you may argue that finding a p-interpolating linear systems system is hard, but if h is very ample, which means this, the uh, map that you get by, uh, by putting all the global section, the basis of the global section to set, that, to set a map in the projective space is an embedding. Okay, so this really defines an embedding of your, of your variety. If you have H like this, then you can take this guy, Q, one, Q plus one times H, this will be P interpolating. So the construction of Ensign of P-covering curves and this construction seems a little similar. So I will spend some time to compare these two constructions. So here I have some curves which covers my point and I also ask for this uh, positive uh, intersection, non-negative intersection. And here I have a linear system. Okay, and I have two bounds. And uh, how can I connect these two bounds. So I can here choose gamma as a linear system, which will be exactly equal to gamma minus p, because it's just the sum of my curves. This defines a divisor. And so it seems to connect these two constructions. And first, it connects these terms. These two terms, in fact, are basically the same. So first remark, Ensign's bound is better, because we have n we have the same bound as here, but with a minus L times the max. Okay, so this looks better. And of course, if I take uh, some element in the linear system, I can write it, write it like this with all the Ni's positive. And the connection is clear. If I take gamma like this, I am sure that gamma minus P is not empty because gamma is equal to gamma minus P. So these curves passes, pass through P. So we are sure that uh, this divisor is contained in gamma minus p. And if I take A like this in gamma minus p, I know that the CI is defined here satisfies this. They cover the points uh, of p. But the main difference is that asking this, if you want the base locus to, has, to have dimension 0, you need to have at least two guys in gamma minus p because otherwise the base locus is just itself, and so it has dimension one. So in the right part, the authors ask for more than one family of covering curves. They, just, they don't just, one, just want one, they want at least two. And from this, they gain something which is quite nice when you, when you work on algebraic geometry, is a good behavior under morphism. So if I know a p-covering system on x, and I define pi as a finite morphism, morphism from x prime to x, and I take p prime in the pre-image of p, then some, something which is easy to see is that, of course, if I take the pullback of the curves, I am still p prime covering. But the problem is that this L may be really, really hard to compute. If I, want, if I take the analog of L on x prime, it will be hard to control. But here, since we have this, it's almost free to, to notice that the pullback of the linear system stays p, interpolating, p prime interpolating. So once you have a p interpolating system on a surface and you construct a sequence of finite morphism, you have a p1 and a p2 interpolating system at each step. And I am talking about a sequence of surfaces, and so maybe you see me coming. These authors 
paved the ground towards codes from towers of surfaces. Because if you know something about AG codes from curves, you know that they are well known for having better parameters than random codes asymptotically for a Q large enough. Okay, and this is due to IRA and Sussman Vladut and Zinc. Okay? And most of the construction of these codes are basically uh, are based on towers of curves, right? And so it may be modular curves or recursive towers or infinite covers using uh, class field theory. And in all of this, you need to control the number of rational points divided by the genius. But the key is to construct an infinite sequence of curves, right? And so why not doing the same thing with surfaces? Because we may get longer codes because a surface with on the same field has more points than a curve. Even if you take maximal curves, you cannot reach Q squared unless you're paying really hard on your genius. So we may get longer codes, but of course it becomes harder because several invariants come into play. You do not have just one as a genius. You have a pair of invariants. You can take, for instance, the square of the canonical divisor and the degree of the second churn class or the Euler characteristic. Of the, of the surface. And in that paper, Couvreur, Lebac, and Perret gave a criterion for, for surface to admit an infinite, towers of, infinite tower of etal covers where a finite set of points of the surface splits completely. So it means that uh, we have many, many, many points. And thanks to their P interpolating system, as soon as they have a P interpolating uh, system on the base, they are able to um, to control the minimum distance in all the tower. Thanks to this really nice property, uh, this really nice behavior under morphism. So it's the first step towards uh, towers of surfaces where maybe we can reach better codes than, uh, than on curves. Okay, so it seems promising because we have some, in, some information about the parameters and as it worked on curves, we want to construct towers of surface because we are mathematicians, but is it really effective? So I will discuss about effectiveness of codes because if, like me, you have tried to sell your math for, uh, for cryptography, for instance, you know how hard it is, right? Because at least for practical applications, we need two things. The first one is encoding. So to do this, we need a basis of the Riemann-Hoch space. And if it is possible, we want a fast evaluation at the points on P. And in most uh, applications, we want also to decode. There exists some application where, where you do not need to decode, but at least you need to encode. And so to encode on curves, people have worked really hard on this. So we have plenty of algorithm to compute a Riemann-Hoch space associated to a, um, a divisor. So they fall into two categories. We have the arithmetic method, which computes some ideals in function fields. And we have also the geometric methods, which falls under uh, brin nuthers uh, theory. And so we have uh, new works with um, more and more generality on the curves, with singularities and so on. So we know how to do things on curves. And if you ask magma on, on a curve, it will use the S algorithm to compute um, Riemann-Hoch basis. And for some family of curves, uh, namely the CAB curves, people have noticed that you can encode really fast using a nice basis and some structured um, set of points. You can uh, evaluate like almost as fast as the Reed solomon code. And it has been done by Bill and Rosenkiel and Solomatov in 2020. On surface, I don't know if you ever tried to ask Magma to compute uh, riemann hoch space on the surface. Isn't, is, he's not too polite with us. It's like, uh, you have to embed it. Like, no, no, I don't want to embed the surface. Come on. Um, so we have no generic methods to compute riemann hoch spaces on surface. But we have some families of varieties with explicit basis of riemann hoch spaces. So when people tell you it's impossible to compute codes from surfaces or from higher dimensional varieties, you can tell them, oh, come on, no, it's not true. And I will, uh, I will give you an argument for the next time you are facing this kind of people. 
uh, 2D code uh, on curves, so we know how to perform unique decoding via error correcting pair, for instance, as introduced in uh, 92 by Pelican and Cutter. And also, we know how to perform list decoding, for instance, uh, Couvreur and Panachonier did it in 2020, but yesterday we heard uh, Maria Montanucci uh, improving list decoding on maximal curves. So it's still, um, we have still ongo ongoing works on uh, decoding efficiently on curves. And as you can imagine, on surfaces, same thing. We have no global decoding for, uh, for codes from surfaces, but there are naturally uh, um, endowed with a local decoding. Okay, so I will now give you these two green parts. What is the family of varieties with explicit Riemann Hall spaces? These are toric varieties. So I really like these varieties because they come with a combinatorial description. We, you know, plenty of the properties thanks to some combinatorics. Why so? Because if you take an integral polytop, which is just the convex L of some points uh, in Zn, this defines an n-dimensional polarized toric variety. So if your polytop has dimension n, this gives you a toric variety of dimension n. And by polarized, I mean this comes with a divisor. And for free, it comes with a basis of the Riemann-Roch space of the divisor, which is a set of polynomials of certain degree. And the space is monomial. So I don't know what people want more than that, because you cannot <laughs> do more explicit than that, OK? <laughs> so what do I mean by that? Um, the, if you take a polytope, the Riemann-Roch space will be spanned, it is, will be isomorphic to uh, the um, space generated by this monomial. So each power corresponds to the coordinate of some integral points in the polytope. So really explicit as soon as you know how to compute integral points in the polytope. And I'm glad that John Voigt in the, in the room to, do, to say that you, used, uh, you, you propose an algorithm to compute this kind of thing. So people work on this, uh, on this kind of thing. And so the size of your polytope is, um, um, gives you, in fact, the degree in L of G. Okay? And so what are toric varieties? You know plenty of them. For instance, projective spaces, if you want to work on P2, you just have this nice triangle. And the fact that is a, it, has, it has length 2 gives you that you work on polynomials of total degree 2. If I draw this rectangle, I am working on P1 cross P1 with by degree 1, 2. And if I draw this nice uh, almost cube, I have P1 cross P1 cross P1 of degree 4, 3, 3. Okay, so really explicit, guys. And so why toric? Why people call them, tor call them toric? It's because they contain a torus. So it is dense for the Zariski topology. And a torus, it's a power of the multiplicative group of the algebraic closure. And so it may be weird, but this guy has really, really, really nice rational points because it's just an FQ star to the n. And so evaluating such monomials at such, there, such, such, such guys, it should not be too difficult, right? And so this is what Hansen proposed in 2002. And people have worked really hard on the parameters of such codes. So Little and Short in 2005, Roano in 2007 for any dimension of the toric variety. And Supernova and Supernova managed to uh, give a nice bound on the minimum distance thanks to the combinatorics of the polytope. And so from the polytope, you read anything that you want about the variety and the code you define thanks to the variety and the divisor. And during my PhD thesis, I uh, defined what I called projective toric codes. So instead of evaluating at just the torus point, I evaluate, I evaluate at all the rational points of the variety, as Lasho did from Rindmuller codes to projective Rindmuller codes. So it has been first uh, looked by Carvalho and Neumann in 2014, if I accept um, uh, works on P1 cross P1. And then uh, during my PhD thesis, I published two papers in 2019, 2020. OK, so nice example of varieties with a combinatorial uh, description, an explicit Riemann-Hoch space. What do people want more? 
<laughs> so, um, what about global decoding? So here I am uh, showing you some remark by Volor and Zarzar in their paper in 2011. Okay, so let's assume that I define an AG code on some surface, and I assume that I have a family of curves, which may be ugly, ugly, but I don't care, and I assume that they are P covering. Okay, so all my evaluation points are contained in at least one of these curves. But I also ask for something more, which is maybe a little too demanding, is that the code is completely characterized by its restrictions to the, to the curve. So it means that, of course, if I have a code word and I restrict the code, so I project on all just the points in CI, these will be um, belonging in the restriction of the code, which is just, as I remember you, I just evaluate at the point on the curve and I have a divisor on the curve. But the other way around is kind of demanding. You want to characterize the code by its restriction. So it means that if you want um, a parity check matrix of C, it is enough to know the parity check matrix on this restriction and then glue them properly. And then you have a parity check for C. Okay. And as soon as you have these really nice peak covering curves, you have a procedure to decode an AG code from the surface. So let's say that I have a word W. I want to decode with respect to the code on the surface. I pick a curve at random. I use the decoding algorithm on the curve, if I am able to decode this. And I replace the coordinate to make them a code in the, um, on, the, on the curve. And I repeat this as many times as I need to be sure that every restriction lies in the restricted code for any i. And since I have this characterization, I know that w is in c. And it has been su successfully applied by Dolor and Zaza in, uh, in 2011 for AG codes from cubic surfaces. And they, and they'll, as far as I remember, they said that it was impossible to uh, decode via magma, but it was possible thanks to this method. But it may fail if you have too many errors gathered on one curve, of course, because your decoding algorithm has some limit. Some limit. And uh, finally, this thing may be really hard. Characterizing, characterizing the code from restriction may be really hard. Maybe not possible. I, uh, I, um, I was kind of um, ambitious by saying that it's not possible, but it may be really hard. But so, if you are not able to decode globally, you are able to decode locally. And this is basically how I will end my talk. What is the local properties of AG codes from surfaces? So first, I will need to remember you what are locally recoverable codes. So a uh, code is said to be locally recoverable. Some people uh, write LRC code, but you say locally recoverable code codes, so it's not so smart. And um, so you know, we say that they have locality L. If for each index you have a set Ji, so in which you do not have high, I, sorry, um, the, um, the cardinality of Ji is exactly equal to L, and this guy will be called the recovery set. And for so it will be locally recoverable if for any code you will be able to recover the ith coordinate by just looking the coordinate gi for gi in gi i. Oh, c'est dur à dire. <laughs> Phew. Letters in English. Uh, okay, you know how to read, right? <laughs> um, okay, so what is the, the interest in this? To correct one value, you do not have to look at the all word, right? You just look at L coordinates. So it's really nice because we live in a world with data as, uh, as big as possible now. And if you want just to correct one coordinate for some uh, protocols of distributed storage, it's really, really useful. Okay? But of course, we know that we have to pay some price in terms of the, uh, in terms of the parameters. And for instance, LRC codes cannot reach the classical single term bounds. If you have locality L, you see that here you will pay some price. Because of course, a code is always K recoverable. 
because it has dimension k. If you read k uh, of the values, you should be able to recover your coordinate. But uh, if you have something L which is less than k, you pay something on the parameters. So you cannot reach um, singleton bounds when you are a non-trivial LRC code. And we know some LRC codes. And I think that you understood that P2, I really like P2. It's a small, it's an easy example for everyone. And of course, read Miller codes are locally recoverable of locality Q minus one. So I will focus on the case on the plain codes, okay? So just bivariate polynomials. And if I want to recover uh, a coordinate associated to a point, I pick a line which contains this point. And so it has a parameterization, x is equal to alpha t plus beta, y is equal to gamma t plus delta. And if I plug this x and y in my polynomials, I get univariate polynomials in t with degree at most r. And so this is a really nice reed solomon code, and some people denote it by their dimension here. So it's a reed solomon code of dimension r plus 1. And if you have worked with codes a little, you know that reed solomon codes are really wonderful, and we know how to correct them, to decode them. And so you use your favorite correction algorithm on reed solomon codes, and you are able to correct one coordinate. So by looking q minus 1 coordinates instead of q squared minus 1. So you, you save um, a square root of, uh, of information to correct your coordinates. And so how can we do this for any surface? Okay, so once again, I have a nice surface, and I assume that I have some curves, but you see they are nicer than before, because now they cover my points, but each of them contains the same amount of points. Let's say L plus 1 points. And so virtually, any codes, when you evaluate at these points, may be L locally recoverable. As soon as you are able to correct on the restriction on the curve. So in most construction, you assume that all these curves are isomorphic, and even more that the restriction codes are all equivalent. For instance, so the, the divisor you obtain by restriction are all linearly equivalent. One thing to get this locality without being uh, disturbed by uh, getting this is kind of doing by reverse. You fix a code on each of these curves, and you construct some subcode of an AG code on a surface, which satisfies the fact that your restriction belongs to the code on the curve. And this equivalent here is uh, represented by this phi i for, for the code. And this is exactly what uh, Salgado Varili, Alvarado, and Voller did in 2021. And uh, Cecilia Salgado presented this uh, work in a previous AG city. So they did it on a root surface, on the root surfaces. So a root surface is a surface with a morphism to a base curve, uh, with this morphism called pi, for instance. And so each fiber above a point is isomorphic to P1. And so if you take some evaluation points and you cover it by some fibers, so by some P1, you can design codes whose restriction to each CI are read solomon code. And so it will be really efficient to correct one coordinate um, using the correcting algorithm of read solomon code. Okay, so finally, I hope that by the end of this presentation, you are kind of convinced that we should study AG code from surfaces. Why? First, and this is the very first argument, we can construct longer codes for, from small alphabet. This was the reason why we looked at AG codes from curves instead of Ritz Solomon code. So this is the same argument. And we know that we need to encode larger and larger data. So we need longer codes. And the geometry, which is way richer than the one of curves, it gives us really natural properties, local properties for the codes on surfaces. So really nice and useful in many applications, for instance, distributed storage. And we have some ingredients to design new families of asymptotically good codes. So let's go. But for the moment, and this is the reason why I think it's the right room of uh, people to address uh, this problem, we lack generic algorithm to encode and decode. 
We have some example of toric varieties, for instance, but nothing generic, as generic as we have the ELS algorithm or something like that. And to, uh, to search for local properties, we have to explore surfaces with the right features uh, to ex expect really the local properties that we want. And as I've uh, shown you in the previous slide, it is not easy. And to hope for asymptotically good codes, we will need a better understanding of the classification of surface of a finite field. And so this concludes my talk, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? And this being recorded, I think that if you want to ask a question, you need to use the microphone. But I have to switch it off. <laughs> So the microphone is ready. What about you? Yes, Hero. Uh, so can you back up three slides? to number 18, where you talked about the, uh, uh, yeah, so you mentioned that this uh, global decoding via local decoding can fail if you have too many errors on one curve. Mm -hmm. Could you do something about this by having some redundancy? You have not, I mean, you have sort of a few extra curves so that if there is one curve that has too many errors, maybe uh, you can use sort of some other curves to yeah, because I think you can, and I think it was the case in Volor's construction, uh, and it is the case on my picture, one point can belong to several curves. So I assume that this is possible. So I am just cautious here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay? Um, but I think on simulations, they proved that it worked. And yeah, if you, if you cover many times, it should be okay. All right, are there any further questions? I think you have... Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, speaking about parameters of uh, codes from surfaces, are there codes you are really proud of? <laughs> okay, so I have at least one. Because, <laughs> because so I worked on toric surfaces, so they are wonderful because they have explicit Riemann Hall basis, but their parameters are terrible. <laughs> so uh, it caused me a great depression during my thesis, but uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we know this life. Um, so one example is the one on Delpizzo surfaces, because they are kind of, um, of nice, so it's not only me, as you can see, we were several uh, people struggling with uh, Del Pezzo surfaces. And so the, the basic idea was we take a Rindmuller codes on the plane, but we want to remove some sections which are highly reducible, you know? And so we ask them to pass uh, through some degree three points, for instance. And to, so we remove like this some uh, union of lines by doing this. And to make it a, a true AG codes, you see this on the, on the blow up of these three points. And this way you have a true AG code and not just like a subcode of a Rindmuller code. And by doing this, we uh, managed to increase the minimum distance by one in one of the codes of code tables. So it wasn't in characteristic two. It was, I think, uh, I don't remember the size of the field, but in characteristic two, we reached the previous parameters. And on code tables, it's kind of nice because we know that people struggle a lot to have good codes on, in characteristic two. So this idea of um, forcing some geometric properties to avoid highly reducible sections, I think it's really smart. And I can say this because it's not my idea. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, it's a good idea and one way to make it AG codes is like this, by blowing up. So this is the reason why we, we are really pedantic to say that this is codes of, from Del Pezzo surfaces when you can uh, see them as codes, subcodes of Rindmuller codes, actually. But this is really nice because you use the geometry to remove the bad sections that you don't want anymore. Did I answer your question? 
Okay. Um, in the in their paper, so I think you should ask uh, Philippe at some point. I, I know that he's it. Just be uh, beside you. Um, so the only surface they looked at is a product of hyperleptic curves, right? If I'm not saying. Uh, um, because they gave, um, so they use Kodaira classification and they say you should not look at rational surface or easy surfaces. And I think their work is really just paving the ground. They do not propose a construction which reach excellent parameters because you know to understand, you need to understand many things about classification of surfaces and I think they're still learning, right? I think I can say this. And um, no, so in terms of towers of surfaces, no. Okay. Maybe I can ask a question on uh, slide 15. Yeah. Oh, wait. Um. Mm? Yeah, that one. So here you actually speak about towers and you compare uh, the curve and the surface situation and there's in red number three class field theory, which is there for the towers of curves. Um, first, why is it in red? And ah. Is there anything which also exists for surfaces? There is also ge geometric class field theory, higher dimensional class field theory. Is that anything? Yeah, because it's exactly the, the, um, the point of view they took in their paper, couvreur le bac and Perret, instead of of um, creating uh, towers, they just create an infinite cover. So this is the reason why they say that this is class field theory instead of towers of uh, surfaces. Uh, I don't know how relevant is my answer, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it's just like, it's not recursively or something like this. You don't define a sequence, you define an infinite covers. This is, I think, the only difference between uh, the red part and the colored one. And it was in red because it was this point of view that they used. I see. It would it be something for surfaces as well, or is it a... You mean for towers, for well recursive towers? For theoretic of point of view, I mean. I mean, th this is what they have done. <laughs> they tried to apply class field theory to surfaces mm -hmm. to, uh, to get this criterion. Ah, okay. So this, uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is what, the, the thing that hasn't been done up to my knowledge is to create recursive towers of surfaces, for instance. Okay, that's really interesting. <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah, one more question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what is an advantage to reduce the size of alphabet? <laughs> um, so, as soon as you reduce the size of your alphabet, you enhance your arithmetic power. Like if you have to perform addition and multiplications in a very, very large field, it will be hard. If you remember Bastien Pacifico's um, slides yesterday, uh, as soon as you, you need to make uh, many pre-computations or something like this to, to handle multiplication. So you win at least a log factor in the size of the field. And for some protocols, it's really important. I mean, some people uh, sell solution based on Reed Solomon codes on uh, encoding really, really fast Reed Solomon codes over alphabet of size uh, almost cryptographic. Like it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> and uh, and if you are able to do this, like by squaring the size of the of the field, it's wonderful. I mean, uh, yeah. All right. Are we done with questions? Do we want coffee? Or is there still <laughs> an urgent question that needs to be asked? Or during the coffee break or something? Uh, it looks like everybody wants uh, more questions, if at all, during the coffee break. So <laughs> let me thank the speaker again, and we will reconvene at 11. <laughs> <laughs>